uh, what Einstein said is relativity theory requires that all events, no matter where they're located in, in the universe, all observers, like you guys sitting in your chairs, no matter where you're located in the universe or in this ballroom, for example, you all have a causal light cone attached to you. And right now, you're sitting at the now. That's the observer sitting right now uh, in this event now. And this is the observer's hyperspace of now. And that hyperspace is three-dimensional space that we live in. And the time axis, the time direction, is vertically up this way. And space is horizontally perpendicular to the two light, to the two cones right there. Okay, so let's look at this chart just to begin with. Okay, so, uh, well, let me, let me, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and start with here. So basically, your causal structure of your past, your present, your future is laid out in what's called the light cone. All of your past activities, your past motion, your past trips, wherever you went, because you cannot reach or exceed the speed of light, your past events of everywhere you've been is always within side the past light cone. So your entire past is kept within this light cone here. And then you move up to the present time right now where you're sitting in your chairs watching me speak, and you're right here. And then everywhere you're going to go from this point on after, after I speak now and then after I give my speech and going forward into the future, you're going to be limited to motion and time and space within the future light cone. So your motion is on a line called a world line. The world means the entire history of your life. And that's a world line, and we call that a time-like world line because it goes in the time direction. Remember, time is vertical, goes up that way, and all three directions of space that you live in is this way. Okay? So this is a world line, a time-like world line of all the events that you've ever done in the past, what's happening to you now, and what will ever happen to you in the future. Now, why they call that a light cone is because you notice this is the cone that swept out. Well, let's look at this guy diagram because it's a lot less confusing. Uh, time is this way, space is that way, and all 45 degree angles with respect to the time and space axis is the surface of the cone, and the only things in the universe that live on that surface are light rays, electromagnetic radiation, hence light cone. So light cone represents the surface of which all light rays everywhere in the universe lives on that surface, right here on that blue shaded surface. Light moves on that on that diagonal line, on that surface, and that's called the light-like world line, okay? So Einstein said, we set up a cause and effect, causality, uh, attached to your light cone of past, present, and future, and therefore you have what's allowed uh, all of the different alignments of the light cones. The light cones of every observer everywhere in space and time are all aligned in the same direction. They have to point in the same direction. So you notice how the time axis is always vertical, and the space direction is always perpendicular, okay? So this observer, this observer, these observers here, they all are lined up in the same direction no matter where they're located. Now here's three observers or three events, and they are legally connected up along a time-like world line so that this observer can see this guy, this guy can see this guy. And so this is a, an allowed motion through space-time. You are allowed to travel through space-time on such a motion as long as you follow an aligned light cone path like that. Now. The perpendicular direction in the space axis is forbidden. That is because I said everything that moves at the speed of light lies on that surface. But what's outside here is forbidden. That's the, surf, that's the spatial region where things go faster in light. And it is forbidden to go outside in this region and go faster in light. You can't do it because of Einstein's universal speed limit restriction. Okay, so that's what special relativity gave us. Well, then in 1915, general relativity comes along. There were problems with Newton's law of gravity. Newton's law was failing at the end of the 19th century. It was making wrong predictions about a number of astronomical things that astronomers were observing. And they were saying, oh, I make all these calculations of what I'm observing, uh, observing using Newton's laws and Kepler's laws of motion, and they're wrong. They were right for most of the planets, but now all of a sudden we're seeing some wrong stuff. And Einstein went back to the drawing board and he said, okay, maybe I can figure something out. Special relativity was a theory of constant motion, constant velocity or relative rest. He did not include forces or accelerations, and that's the difference. So Einstein went back to the drawing board of relativity theory and he said, what happens if I include forces and acceleration in space-time? Well, a big startling thing happens. You warp space. You basically, come up, you basically end up replacing Newton's laws of motion and gravity. Uh, all forces and accelerations are replaced by curved or warped space-time geometry. Picture space-time again as a flat surface, but it's more like a, a stiff rubber sheet. You put a heavy ball in it, or a bowling ball, or, or a, a lead ball in it, or even the planet Earth right there, and that heavy mass will bend the space-time around it. And you see that bending 
right there. See, the space is flat out here, but the Earth is rotating around, and it's bending space in because of its big mass. And because the Earth rotates, it's also dragging it. Uh, think of space-time as like a rubbery sheet molasses. So when you have a rotating star, planet, or galaxy, that rotation causes space to drag around it. That's called frame dragging. So that's what Einstein discovered. What you think is a force, what you feel is an acceleration in your car or in a plane or in your emotion is not a real force and it's not a real acceleration. Instead, it's curvature, this curvature. This is the gravity that holds you on the planet Earth. There's this curvature right there. That's what Einstein discovered. And what's wonderful is it has special relativity theory already built in. Uh, it's very well tested. And here's the beauty of it. Because space can be curved, guess what Einstein discovered? The light cones of causality are not universally fixed for all observers. Some light cones can be tilted over with respect to other light cones in warped spaces. And so here's an example of the tilting. So here's the time axis. Here's the space axis. This is the space of forbidden motion, remember? Uh, this is the hyperspace that all of your three-dimensional space is in, and your present is right there at the point in between the two cones, the past and the future. And now curved space, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to bend, I'm going to bend space with some kind of fictitious mass. You can't see it here, it doesn't matter. But I'm bending space along these arrows. That's what this means. Space is curved around like that. So this observer here is going to observe this guy right there. And there's this guy right there at that point. And do you notice that his light cone is tilted over? It's really cool. His light cone is tilted over, and you notice his time direction is that way, his space direction is that way. But relative to this guy, this guy is almost moving at the speed of light. His position is such that this guy here is looking at him, and he's tilted almost 45 degrees. And remember, anything that's at roughly 45 degrees is moving at the speed of light. Now take a look at this guy. This guy is so tilted over, his future is pointed that way, his past is right here, it goes that way, and his forbidden space region is this way. But look at this guy. This guy is looking at this guy, this uh, first person right here, is looking at that event or that person right there, and he says, wait a minute, his time-like direction, his time-like world line is pointing in the forbidden direction, that way. That means he's going faster than light. But wait a minute, is he violating Einstein's light speed limit? No. Because this guy's time axis is that way. His time-like world line is moving within the light cone. He's not violating light speed in his reference frame. In his reference frame, he is moving within the light cone. He is moving less than the speed of light. But this guy says, oh, that guy's moving faster than light. Because remember, the light cone is tilted with respect to that one. And this one is another one where it's tilted almost in a 45 degree angle. This guy's future is going that way. His past is that way. So this guy sees him as going, wait a minute, wait a minute. This guy's future is up that way, right? This guy's future is down that way. Oh, this guy's going backwards in time. He's in a time machine. He's going backwards with respect to this guy. This guy is also going backwards with respect to that guy. See, this guy's future is that way. His past is that way. Now, he's moving in a time-like direction, right? You see, it's vertical with respect to him. So they're aligned. Their time-like directions are aligned, but the future is down for this one, and the past is up. And this guy is going kind of almost uh, going faster than light. So that's how you go faster than light without going faster than light. You can break the light speed barrier, but relatively, relative to other observers who are not in a, uh, in a uh, curved space-time. Okay, so now you've got the tools you need to understand warp drives and wormholes. Okay, Einstein's general theory predicts two types of faster than light space warps that give us that effect that I showed you of the curved space and the tilting light cones. First one is traversable wormholes, which were discovered by Kip Thorne and his postdocs and grad students in 1985 to 88 at Caltech. And warp drives, discovered as a solution to Einstein's theory of relativity by Miguel Alcubierre, uh, who was then at the University of Spain, I can't remember now, Portugal maybe. Okay, I want to show you a little math, not because I'm going to melt your brains here, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what these things look like. That's Einstein's general theory of relativity, the field equations for curved space-time. This object here is called the energy momentum or stress energy tensor. That encodes the material properties of matter, like the Earth, you, chair, atoms, uh, suns, and galaxies. So you put matter here, this is the matter, that's going to bend space, and that's the Einstein curvature tensor. This is the quantity that measures the warping or bending of space. Remember what I said about warping? I don't have a piece of paper, but just take a piece of paper and bend it. That's warping, okay? I'm using that word synonymously with curving and bending. So warping or space-time curvature is represented there. Uh, this is the coupling constant. That's Newton's uh, constant of gravity, the universal gravitational constant. 
And that's the speed of light to the fourth power. A pi, A times pi times g over c to the fourth power. Anyway, that looks like an elegant, simple equation. It's really not. It's 10 nonlinear partial differential equations with symmetry conditions and boundary conditions. It's a nasty mathematical mess, but it's a lot of algebra. So here's what Einstein's general theory says. You put a source of matter into space here, and output comes curves. Matter curves space, and curved space tells matter how to move through curved space. OK. Oh, I didn't talk about the last thing. OK. Uh, Einstein's general relativity says, for faster than light space-time geometries, you know, to give you the, uh, the space geometry of curvature that you need to make a wormhole or warp drive, requires a type of matter that's exotic. It's not like the type of normal matter that we're all made out of. And it turns out it's exotic because it violates some heavy-duty mathematical conditions that Stephen Hawking invented back in the 70s. We don't need to get into that. And the type of exotic matter is negative vacuum energy, no problem. We've got negative vacuum energy. Anything that has a negative energy density or a negative energy flux is predicted by quantum field theory and it's observed in nature. Okay. Okay, that's the taxonomy of traversable wormholes. So these are the type of traversable wormholes that you can have. And this is how they connect up with things in space. You'll have connections through space, time, and universes. Uh, you have different throats. Wormholes can have a variety of different throat shapes, like those things here. And then wormholes can also be time machines. Warp drives. Well, warp drives, you have uh, Alcubierre's original expansion and contraction of space. Uh, then there's Van den Broek, who modified uh, Alcubierre's warp drive to lower the energy requirement. I'll talk about that briefly. And then there's Notario's warp drive. Notario did have a different warp drive, and I'll explain that when I get to Alcubierre's warp drive. And then here are the alter alternate uh, quantum gravity models of warp drive. Sonny White at NASA and myself have a, uh, have a extra space dimensional warp drive. And then uh, there's one by Richard Abusi who uses Casimir energy and extra space dimensions to fuel a warp drive. And then uh, Hal Putoff and myself and Claudia McConey have the polarizable vacuum model. And I'm not going to get into a lot of those because that's pretty heavy duty stuff. Um, this is the basic premise of Alcubierre's warp drive. Here's the starship. The space time grid is flat here around the starship. He feels no forces and no acceleration, no curvature, no curvature. So he's going to feel the bubble of negative energy, some sort of negative vacuum energy. And that bubble is going to contract all of the space going out to the destination star light years away. And it's going to push back all the space behind him to push the Earth farther away. And that's how you're able to go faster than light without going faster than light. This guy's not moving. He's sitting in flat space at relative rest. He isn't moving and doing anything. It's the warping of space here and here that's moving him. It's like a surfer on a surf. And the uh, wave of the surf is carrying him toward the beach faster than light. Whereas if he was swimming through the water, he'd be limited to the speed of light. And he'd be spending a lot of energy kicking his arms and legs trying to swim to the beach. Where here, the surf on the wave is going to be pushing him faster than light. So that's how that works. And here's another representation for the Alcubierre warp drive. Here, space is flat. There's no curvature. Here's your starship. This represents the volume of space that's collapsed from your location to your destination star. This represents the volume of space from you to your departure planet, like Earth will be there, that you're pushing away from you. And that's what that represents. A traversable wormhole, this is called the flam diagram. And what it shows you is regular space time, right here, right there. And here's point A, and here's point B. And a light ray is going to move at the speed of light, departing from point A. And it's going to have to go all the way through normal space time to get to point E, point B, I'm sorry. That's going to take a heck of a long time. Because remember, space is so big that light speed is slow. So if distances are measured in light years, it's going to take light years, you know, years for light to reach those. Well, traversable wormhole says, let's take negative vacuum energy. And let's create a shell of it around the location, open up a, a throat, push space open to form a throat. And thus, you have the throat of the wormhole. And instead of going this way, you're going to go through the wormhole. And it's, a, it's like a hyperspace tunnel, a shortcut from point A to point B, and you bypass this, all this distance and all the years you have to travel. Instead, this could be a matter of a few days or a few seconds of trip time, and you've effectively moved faster than light. You might put on a rocket on your back, or you might walk through here at 30 miles an hour, and you will have traversed this entire 10 light year distance in a matter of a few days or a few seconds. So even though the guy going through the wormhole did not go faster than light, he didn't reach the speed of light. He's just walking through, or he's got a rocket backpack pushing him through. He's going to be going at a slow speed. But to everybody out here, everybody out here, they're looking at this motion occurring, and they're going to measure him with their clock saying, wait a minute, he just jumped 10 light years in a matter of days or hours. 
So he went faster than light from their viewpoint. That's because the light cones are tilted with respect to here and here. So this is what a spherical wormhole looks like. If that's the sun in the background and a throat is opened up, there's a negative energy uh, shell around here, you would see a galaxy shrunken and distorted. It, it's inverted. You'd be looking through. It's like, a mag it's like an inverse magnifying glass. Here's a stargate opened up in Times Square. This represents the stargate solution where the, uh, where the wormhole is not spherical. It's got a flat door-like opening. And here's another version of the flat door-like opening there. And uh, that's, the, that's the, uh, uh, the stargate solution. What it means is the negative energy, the negative pressures and stress are all zero in that particular case. All right, so I talked about negative energy. So what are the negative energies? Well, here's the taxonomy of exotic matter according to nature and quantum field theory. So there are all the forms of negative energy. And this is really heavy-duty physics here, so I won't get into a lot of it. But let me just say that the yellow objects here that are identified in yellow, those are observed in the lab, or we see it in nature somewhere, or it is expected to occur but is not yet observable. But it has measurable consequences that you can observe. So these are the types of negative vacuum energy or exotic matter that we have in nature. And uh, here's the Casimir vacuum energy associated with the Casimir effect. And here are the ones that we also realize. Anything in red is, uh, is fictional. It's uh, theoretical speculation. All right. Now, to talk about how much energy does it take to power these things compared to all the propellant you have to put in a space shuttle to move it to Alpha Centauri or all the propellant to move into an antimatter rocket or a fusion rocket, we've got to look at the reality of what the energy requirements of warp drives and wormholes are. Uh, this word total is a mistake. That's an error I didn't catch in time. This should say net negative energy to produce a spherical traversable wormhole. Our throat is the diameter of the radius. You can take your choice. The energy of the wormhole is negative. Remember, I said it's negative. 10 to the 44th times the radius of the wormhole throat, or the diameter of the throat. That's nasty. And that doesn't make it look as, real, as, as much better as an antimatter rocket or a fusion rocket. Now, for a warp drive, it turns out that is the total energy. The total, energy, the total negative energy to produce a warp drive is going to be given by the uh, warp speed of the bubble. The, you know, it's surrounded by a bubble. And that bubble has a dimensionless warp speed. It's a, it's a fraction of the speed of light, like warp 1, warp 2, warp 3, so forth. R is the radius of the warp bubble, and sigma is the inverse uh, of the bubble wall thickness. So that's the negative energy, negative 10 to the 44th times the square of the warp speed times the square of the radius of the bubble times the inverse thickness of the warp bubble wall. That's nasty. That's a lot of negative energy there, and I'm going to show you some numbers. General relativity constrains warp speed to be less than or equal to this number given here. Uh, M ship is the mass of the starship, delta is the thickness of the warp bubble wall, and R is the radius of the warp bubble wall, of the warp bubble. Uh, it just says that the net, and there's a condition that the net total energy stored in the warp bubble cannot be greater than that contained in the starship itself. That's to maintain energy conservation. Okay, so here's the bonfire of the realities. Now I'm going to take those negative energies of a wormhole and divide it by the speed of light squared. That'll give me an equivalent negative mass. I want to use an equivalent mass to show you the comparison of how bad this, the magnitude of this negative energy really is. For a, warp, uh, for a wormhole of a radius of 1,000 meters, you're going to need negative 710 times Jupiter's mass. Equivalent. Remember, the it's really energy, but I turned it into mass units. For a, a wormhole of 10 meters diameters, it's negative 7 times Jupiter's mass. And for 1 100th of a meter, 0.01 meters, your uh, wormhole energy requirement is going to be negative 23 times Earth's mass. So here's Jupiter's mass in kilograms, here's Earth's mass in kilograms. And this is really ugly. Warp drives. OK, well, it's even bad for warp drives. Here's the warp bubble speed, the speed at which the warp drive is relatively moving with respect to non-moving observers. So you got warp, what is it, uh, 10 to the negative 5, 10 to the negative 4, 0.01 warp. 0.5 warp, warp 1, warp 2, warp 10, and warp 100. Those are fractions of the, those are multiples of the speed of light. Take a look at the energy requirement. Look at the size of those numbers. Negative, all of those are negative, of course. And look at the power on the 10 and compare it with the positive mass energy density, uh, the, the total mass energy of the sun in joules. That's in joule units. This is pretty bad. So what do we do? Well, there's some options. And I didn't mention one thing about wormholes. The reason why I said that was net energy, not total, is because the total energy of a wormhole can be positive, zero, or negative, depending upon how it's constructed. And I showed you an example of a zero energy wormhole. That's the Stargate solution. OK, so there's some alternatives. We have uh, my colleague in, uh, in Longview, Texas, Richard Abusi, got his PhD at Baylor on this. 
you use negative Casimir vacuum energy in extra space dimensions. This comes from superstring theory. And it turns out that if you apply that to a warp drive, you can get the energy down to negative, the equivalent negative mass of Jupiter. And that's a lot lower. That's about the size of a wormhole, or, uh, of a wormhole energy requirement. However, these guys found that, uh, uh, Richard and his colleagues found that there's going to be a maximum quantum speed limit for warp drives. It'll be 10 to the 32 times the speed of light. That's one followed by 32 zeros times the speed of light. But for all intents and purposes, that's pretty huge. That's pretty big. Harold White, that's Sonny White, my colleague at NASA. Uh, we found a way, both of us, I gave him this idea to do the study. And he looked at taking the warp bubble and pulsing it at high frequency so that you can lower the energy demand on average and you crunch all your energy into a peak pulse width uh, spaced out in very short time intervals. That's what we do in directed energy weapons. That's how you create high powered laser weapons. Uh, a laser like this is powered by batteries. This thing won't be able to produce megawatt power, but I could produce megawatts of peak power if it's pulsed up to megawatts and the average taken over time is gonna be very low energy. So, uh, so he did an analysis of doing such a thing. He, uh, he did high frequency pulsing of the warp bubble. He shrank the thickness of the warp, oh, I'm sorry, he increased the warp bubble wall and he made it thicker. And the result is, is that the energy of the warp is much smaller. And what's the equivalent mass of that energy? He found out that you could get it down to roughly negative 722 kilograms. That's something we can engineer. So we finally have a warp bubble uh, energy requirement that's engineerable and uh, doable. It's practicable. So this is pretty promising, and this is where we're, we're, he and I are doing our research right now to move forward. All right, so we're talking about producing negative vacuum energy. Okay, there are a variety of different ways of producing negative vacuum energy, and I'm only going to just review them quickly. This is called squeezed light, and it's a special form of light from a laser beam, and you put it through a lithium niobate crystal, and there's other kind of crystals you can use. And what it has the effect of is producing alternating pulses, the red pulses of positive energy, and the yellow pulses are the alternating pulses of negative energy. And if you have some kind of a fast rotating mirror, you can separate out the positive pulses and the negative pulses and concentrate the negative pulses right here. And that would be what you'd use to build your wormhole or warp drive with. Another way would be a series of, uh, not, not three, but a whole bunch of these photon emitters. And you'll combine all of their photons into a manifestly negative pulse of energy in a beam. And that's just a device that does the switching. We can't realize rotating mirrors like this. This mirror has to rotate once every 10 to the negative 15 seconds. But with the sodium gas cell, we can rotate, we can do an effective mechanical rotation electrodynamically here in the gas cell uh, much faster than that. So this is how you would uh, implement a rotating mirror. The Casimir effect. Two plates, like a capacitor plates, block out the outside vacuum fluctuations in the quantum vacuum. And what's left is a reduced state energy inside the plates. And, in, and here the energy happens to be negative. And it's very weak. It's not usable. But it exists in nature. And we, we routinely, routinely make these in lab. This is a, a mirror, and if you take a mirror and you accelerate it rapidly through space, it will, it will excite the quantum vacuum fluctuation and create a flux of negative energy. A beam of negative energy will be emanating from in front of its motion. And the best one that we've identified in the last four years is a parabolic cylindrical mirror, just like these that are used for solar thermal energy uh, converters. Uh, the idea is that you put this in the vacuum of space, and it's going to focus all of the vacuum fluctuations that strike the mirror, they're going to focus along the focal line of the mirror. And Larry Ford at Tufts University did a calculation with his colleague Spader, and they figured out that the energy of the vacuum fluctuations that collects on that focal line is negative. And not only is it negative, it's astronomically negative. I had my student in Georgia Tech do a calculation of a micron size, a, a, a mirror the size of the width of my hair, and we produced like negative 10 to the 30th joules per cubic meter. One cubic meter of space contains negative 10 to the 30th joules. So we think we've got the way of producing word drives and wormholes now. So this would be the way to do it. These processes are going to be weak and difficult to implement. This is really, the, the negative energy you get out of this is too weak to matter. Okay, if you're going to build a warp drive and a wormhole, you need to be able to detect the negative energy. It's like all radio engineers and light engineers. You have uh, devices that detect the light tells you how intense and bright it is, what its wavelength is. Or you have radio detectors, radio receivers, that'll tell you FM or AM radio signals, what the broadband wavelength is, and blah, blah, blah. OK, well, we got to have that for negative energy. And we implement that using what's called a balanced homodyne detector, which were invented in the early 80s for the purpose of measuring the states of non-classical light. I'm just going to say, basically, it's, remember that uh, previous graph, uh, that previous thing I showed you, squeeze light? OK, well, 
the balanced homonide detector was, was specifically invented to measure this, to see the alternating pulses of negative and positive energy. And in fact, there it is. There's the raw data that was measured in the early 80s of positive, and the negative energy is in that little valley right there. Positive, negative energy, positive, and so forth. And uh, this is called quantum tomography. It's like a CAT scan tomography, or posit uh, positron electron tomography that medical doctors use to scan slices of your body tissue to hunt for tumors and, and uh, damaged tissues. And uh, so a tomography can see this, and this is a squeezed vacuum state. There's the positive energy there, and the negative energy is this way. Well, the next thing that has not been done yet is doing a quantum tomography of the negative energy inside of a casimir cavity. And that's what I'm working on with my coworkers at EarthTech now. The idea is to put two miniaturized nanoscale photodiodes inside of a cav cavity, about a millimeter on each side, on each plate, and the plates are separated by one micrometer, the width of my hair. And I want to make a measurement of the negative energy, and that's what it will look like. This is a computer model simulation of the actual of this version. This is the modified version of that. I'm not going to be able to implement this for this because they're two different systems. So I'm going to have a version of, of this here, and what it's going to give me is this. And these uh, colored regions represent where the uh, mathematics breaks down right there at, at stationary modes inside the cavity, and we're not going to be expected to see anything. But the negative energy is going to be observed here. If you, if you insert the nanoprobes inside the cavity, this is how much the nanoprobes will disturb the uh, transverse electric mode inside the cavity. Now that looks like a lot, but it's not. It's only 0.4% disturbance, so that's good. That's actually what we want. Okay, I'm getting close to finishing. This is the toughest problem that we have yet, and I'm not there yet. I'm, not, I'm still dealing with detecting negative energy and making negative energy, producing it and detecting it. We're nowhere near this. How do we construct a wormhole? We don't know how. I mean, Einstein's general theory of relativity, that equation I showed you, doesn't tell you how to do engineering. It just tells you how, uh, it just says, if you want to design your space time, you want to design curvature and warps, then it'll tell you what kind of matter you need on that right-hand side, that T tensor, okay? And we know what that is, but it doesn't tell you how to implement it using technology. That's the problem. It tells you how to predict this stuff, but you don't know how to build it. So we can only speculate, maybe just take a, a frame like this of Ford Seder mirrors. Maybe this is a line of parabolic mirrors all along here and they're shooting negative energy down to create the spherical throw to the wormhole. And a spaceship just goes through that opening and goes right into the wormhole. Um, or maybe you might have an array of Ford's fader mirrors like this, and the negative energy is pulled off the focal lines, and they all concentrate at that little point there, and the rocket's going to have to go into that little hole in the middle. See, the idea, remember, is we got to thread a throat with negative energy in order to push space out, stretch it out, hold it open, and make that hyperspace shortcut so that you can dive into it and come out the other side. See, that's, that's just a fictional diagram of what it looks like in two dimensions. Okay, that's what a flam diagram looks like. Warp drives, again, that's even more speculative. You know, that's the Star Trek uh, warp drive engine from uh, the next generation. Unfortunately, we don't know how to do that. We probably are going to have to do something similar to this with the Ford Stator mirrors. Okay, so let's assume we, we've already got uh, our warp drive generator, our warp bubble negative energy generator, our detectors, our engineers have detectors. They can see the negative energy so they can locate it, shape it, position it in the right places, and we're all good and, and swell. All right, and now we can build the warp drive. Now what happens when you're going to start flying? When you start flying, you've got a couple pictures. You've got the, the observer's view. You guys are all the astronomers on the planet Earth. You're looking up in your telescope, you're looking up at the Milky Way at the night sky, and all of a sudden you see this crazy thing. All of a sudden, your view is pinched off like this. And then this transition thing goes by you as it moves. And you see this distortion as this thing is transiting across your field of view. And then as it moves away from you, you see that. Well, that's what a warp drive looks like through your telescope. So that's what you would expect to see as an astronomer. If you're sitting in your starship, this is what you're going to see through your, uh, through your forward view window and your rear view window. And this is when you're at stop. You see the stars here? and the stars there, forward and aft, through your front and back windows. Now, if you're moving at 10 times the light speed, you notice how the stars now collapse down to those regions. And then if you're moving at 100 times light speed, the stars are now bundled up into little balls. Uh, they're blue for the, the blue Doppler shifting going forward, and the red Doppler shifting going backwards, away from you. For traversable wormholes, if you're inside that throat, this is what you're going to see. You can't navigate that. This, there's nothing to navigate with here. You're going to have all this distorted light that's all going to be shoved around and distorted by the negative energy that's holding up the throat. Negative energy is gravitationally repulsive. 
See, we're all, all of us are made out of positive energy, like this, the atoms in our bodies and the floor and whatnot. That's gravitationally attractive. That's why the moon, the positive mass of the moon and the positive mass of the, of the earth are gravitationally attracting. But negative energy is repulsive. It pushes things away, so light gets just pushed away into these distorted uh, shapes here. Okay, well, we've come to the conclusion. So uh, what do I have left to do? I've, I've given you the grand tour, and right now, uh, Earth Tech, which is my employer, we're looking at the critical technology uh, issues, and we've started an experimental program to produce negative vacuum energy in large amounts. And what's important is the scalability of present technologies. Can we scale up negative energy de uh, generators that I showed you up to large sizes? Can we explore new ways to produce it? Are there other methods to produce negative energy other than the Ford Spader mirror? Can we scale those methods up? Uh, and then we're going to look at the Ford Spader mirror itself, the parabolic cylindrical mirror, and maybe even new advanced laser photonics to maybe find new ways to increase the amount of negative energy that a pulse laser can produce. Uh, detecting negative vacuum energy, that's pretty much what I described was the balanced home eye detector in a Casimir cavity. That has not been done yet. After all these decades, since 1981, when IBM first developed the balanced home eye detector, no one has measured the negative energy in a Casimir cavity. So I'm the guy who's going to do it. I didn't predict it. Uh, a colleague of mine who's a German, I'm sorry, he's a Polish physicist. He's a postdoc at the University of Duisburg, Essen in uh, Duisburg, Germany. And uh, he published two peer reviewed papers describing the balanced home eye detector needed to do a Casimir cavity experiment. And I'm collaborating with him. I brought him out to Texas and uh, he visited us with us over uh, the 4th of July holiday in 2011, and we are working on building his experiment to test it. The next thing is to gain new insights by simulating FTL space warps. One thing is, is I told you about Einstein's general theory of relativity. The, that's 11 nonlinear partial differential equations, and the math is a bitch. So you, the best thing we've learned how to do this stuff is you can't do it by hand anymore. The calculations get, can take years doing it manually. The best thing to do is use supercomputer computer simulation modeling. Throw this stuff into computer uh, numerical algorithms and simulation modeling for visualization. And there are packages available now that were invented by physicists and published in the peer review in the last couple of years. And those packages do exactly that. They've, uh, they've devised these packages for the purpose of looking at what happens when matter falls into black holes, how a black hole forms during stellar collapse, what happens when you go on the inside of the event horizon of a black hole, and the production of gravitational waves from a black hole as matter falls into it. So that package is actually the kind of package we need, and we've got that package, and, and one of the next things we're going to do, probably about two years from now, is begin a high-powered supercomputer numerical al algorithm simulations to do visualization of how a warp looks when you try to build it. And the last important thing is uh, lab experiments using what's called simulation or analog gravity. It's where you can do gravity on the tabletop in a laboratory using electromagnetic radiation. And what you're using are metamaterials. You're going to use metamaterials to reshape light. And you're going to reshape light in ways that will reproduce the effects of a warp drive or a wormhole. They've already been doing similar effects like that with sound waves to study black holes. And they're also doing that with light waves now to study black holes using a simulated experiment. Instead, you're going to create space-time in the lab and you're going to bend that space-time, only that space-time is not real space-time, it's electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation can be treated like a space-time, it can be curved and manipulated and bent like a space-time, so you can get it to behave like a black hole, or the planet Earth, or a rotating mass, or a warp drive in a wormhole. And so, uh, you use that, you use uh, metamaterials to shape the space of electromagnetic light, electromagnetic radiation going around the metamaterial to create the effect of warp drives and wormholes. And, um, that is pretty much the whole thing, I think. So is this going to be our future? That's the question. Thank you. Mm.